very thankful to be here and to be the speaker at this great occasion. And I'm thankful for the study and all of the wonderful work that goes in to make this possible. This is a pretty interesting topic. And once upon a time, it would have, uh, it, well, once upon a time, I would have been in the middle of this. But that's been a long time ago. Okay, questions. I was given eight questions, and uh, I'll get to them. I'll give them in about two minutes at the end, so hang on. What does a healthy dating relationship slash friendship look like? Can single women and single men of comparable dating ages just be friends, and if so, how? Should dating singles always be chaperoned? What about online dating? With regard to contemporary dating practices, what's off limits for Christians? When we talk about best dating practices, how do we distinguish between biblical principle and cultural preference? Can Christians date outside the church? What about flirt to convert? Now, Roger said he'd been married 40 years. Good for him. Um, I've been married 48, so if, if we're going to brag... <laughs> Cassie has, my wife, Cassie has put up with so much. And it's amazing that I've been married to her for all these years that she's put up with me. And as a result of being happily married to her, I have zero experience with the world of dating. I do remember what it was like to, you know, get the horse all brushed down, get the buggy all, you know, do all of those good things. I, I'm blessed, though, to be at the age where my children's children are dating and getting married. And then I also realize that what I thought I knew, I don't have a clue about today's dating. And I suspicion that's the way it was when I was dating. Because then in those days, those who were my age knew what I was talking about when it was brush the horse and hook up the buggy. So today's dating is not at all like mine, but it is real. And it's something that we as God's people need to understand. The word date itself was coined in 1896 in a column in the Chicago Record where this fellow that was losing his girlfriend said, I suppose the other boys fill in all my dates. And you may not think that that was something that was new, but it was in those days. The concept of dating and courtship, those are not biblical words, nor is the process given a lot of attention in the Scriptures, but there is sufficient information for us to understand the topic and to know who God expects us to be in the courtship process. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 2, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. So we find there that marriage is presented as a natural pairing with God's gift of desire. Marriage is an expected consequence, a moral accompaniment to honor desire, a gift that God gives freely to all. God's natural gift of desire is thus presented as a motivation for marriage, which necessarily infers a process of mate selection. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 7 through 9 speaks to that subject of desire. If they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. It is better to marry than to burn with passion. So fulfilling a natural gift of desire for intimacy is not the only reason for marriage, but marriage is one of God's solutions to avoid sins of immorality. There is no step-by-step -step guide in the Bible of how to go from meeting to marriage. But we do see many different examples of mate selection. Mate selection by creation, Adam and Eve, by assignment, Abraham assigning the task of finding a spouse for Isaac to a trusted servant. Take a look at that vow sometime. Mate selection as wages, Jacob for Rachel and Leah. Mate selection by gift, King Saul's daughters, Merib and, and Michal. And mate selection by lust. And there we get to Samson and the women, uh, Timna and Delilah. And it says, Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as a wife. So we see parental involvement here where Samson told his father, get her for me. Now that actually indicates some type of a system of mate selection that involved parents talking to parents on behalf of their children. We also have mate selection by political assignment, uh, by political agreement. Uh, uh, Solomon married one of Pharaoh's daughters when he made a treaty with the king of Pharaoh. And I trust many of Solomon's wives 
were, were uh, married to him in this fashion accompanying a treaty. We also have made selection by capture for the wives of the men of the tribe of Benjamin in Judges chapter 21. This is the last of the book of Judges. It ends with this account. And it seems that the last verse of the book may be a commentary on what had just happened when it says in verse 25 of Judges 21, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And I do believe that that's where we are today in most matters of morality, that everyone or nearly everyone does what is right in his or her, her own eyes. In most of the cited cases thus far of mate selection, there's little to resemble courtship the way we often think of it today. When we look at the Bible examples reviewed for mate selection, usually the man and his family are the ones doing the selecting of wives. The women at first do not appear to have been given a voice in the process. Now that was not the case with Rebecca, who married Isaac. Abraham's servant had come to her home to seek a wife for young Isaac at the request of Abraham. He asked Abraham to leave her home, her immediate family, and go with him, the servant, a man she had just met, to marry a man she had never met. So... Uh, Rebecca's family said, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. So then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. And she did. Thus far, most marriages we see in the scriptures were arranged relationships. That is still how many marriages happen today around the world. In many instances, the arrangements between families have been made many years before the wedding and the couple may have had very little involvement with one another prior to the wedding. Well, also, in many nations, marriages today are also by choice. So I asked a couple of fellows that I study with in India who have young children, when your children grow up, um, are you going to arrange the marriage or do you want them to choose? And one said, oh, I will arrange. And he was very serious. And the other one said, oh, I will let them choose. And he was very serious. And that represents what is around the world that we may not be comfortable with and accustomed to as far as arrangement of marriages is concerned. Now, in many instances, that is very, very abused, as we know, in some nations and under some religions. But not every place, of course, abuses uh, the arrangement of marriages. Now, in the United States... The majority of relationships and marriages today are by choice, the mutual choice between the man and the woman. Now, this is a change in the United States and our culture from the norms of earlier centuries. By the end of the 1800s, uh, mate selection was dominated more by the woman and her family than by the men of the day. There were culturally acceptable courtship norms and rituals for the various levels of society, and at the upper levels of a sophisticated society, there were rules for even proper introduction. After that, a man could call at the home of a potential wife to see if he would be allowed to get to know the family and the young lady. Calling cards were part of this ritual, allowed the woman and her family a time of review to accept or reject his overtures, to check his bank account and the size of his farm, etc., things like that. If his interest was acceptable with the family and with the young lady, usually in that order, he would be granted time to get to know the young lady in a public setting such as the parlor of the young lady's home. The couple were easily either chaperoned or closely watched by a sibling, the younger sibling of the family. Whenever the suitor was at home, very rarely were they ever allowed to be alone. And if they took a walk, they had to be within view, and he could only touch her if the terrain was rough and she might stumble. So, of course, she might stumble just so he could touch her, as we can imagine. Okay, this system of courtship existed during what is known as the Victorian Age of Romance, and it was popularized by writings such as the novels of Jane Austen, and many in the audience will recognize these titles. Well, Jane Austen's world was spoken of by a professor that said her works of fiction conform to the conventions of late 18th century novels of courtship and romance. What distinguishes the plot of the courtship novel is its depiction of the entrance of a young woman into adult society and her subsequent choice among competing suitors. The choice is not without its anxieties, however, for one of the unstated conventions of the courtship novel is that the lovers must undergo a traumatic experience, a violent shift from innocence to self-knowledge before their union can be consummated. Well, in looking at Jane Austen's novels and the world of romance novels, we can see a slight abridgment of Pride and Prejudice in this cartoon. If I could do this. 
Okay, here's how it starts. I hate you. <laughs> Things happen. Here's how it ends. I love you. Okay, there you go. I've saved some of <laughs> I've saved some of you hours upon hours upon hours. Okay. Now, many will recognize a very familiar theme in this illustration. This is the basic plot of most romance stories, novels, and plays ever written, going back to the time of Shakespeare and even long before. Romantic movies today usually follow this same pattern, including Hallmark movies, which have been mentioned. Since 2009, Hallmark has aired more than 300 Christmas movies. And in the category of writing, nearly everyone lives happily ever after in romance writings, except for Nicholas Sparks, novels and movies which I absolutely refuse to read or watch. If I'm going to cry in movies, which I usually do, I want them to be happy tears and not because some favorite character got killed off by the author. Okay, I don't know where you are with all of that, but that's me. <laughs> so what does the 1880s have to do, or the 1800s novels have to do with dating today? Well, how does today's dating world work? If our culture marries by choice, where can I go to find someone to date and to love and to marry? Well, a lot of times in our culture, in and out of the church, someone will say, well, I, I've read a novel or two. I, I've seen a Hallmark movie or two. I know how it works. I don't have to go anywhere. God will just send me the one, and we will live happily ever after. And that is real to many, many people. It's like there's this funnel that everyone is going through and this funnel accompanies the belief that everything happens for a reason. So somebody is shifting through all of these folks and out is going to come my, my special one. Well, is that the way it works? Well, the scriptures indicate that marriage is a privilege rather than a right. God does not demand marriage of anyone, as we've heard. Many get caught up in popular versions of such verses of Jeremiah 29, 11, and the Living Bible paraphrases, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And this is God's word for a nation, not for a single Christian. But individuals misunderstanding these words then say, God has a plan for me in my life, and by that by they, they mean, I know He will send me the one that I am supposed to marry. There is no indication in the Scripture that I'm aware of that God today preselects spouses for us at all. He does know all things, of course, but that does not mean He chooses to manipulate everyone in the world for us to have our perfect mate fall out of the funnel. And I do believe that it is misconception about romance and how to find a mate that contributes to the dissatisfaction in dating today. So in Pew Research, which is a very handy tool, as Roger showed us, when you ask daters, how's it going for you? How's dating going? Overall, 67% of them say, not very good. Not very good. And is it hard today to find a date? 75% say it's very or somewhat difficult. Now, this was a survey taken before COVID, and it's of worldly folks. And I suspicion that among God's people, the same satisfactions exist. Here's four steps that have been authored about dating. Initial meeting and, and attraction, curiosity, interest, and infatuation, becoming a couple, commitment or engagement, and at each stage there are do's and don'ts for Christians. So now we're going to meet somebody. Okay, out of all of the world, what do we have? Well, we have nearly 8 billion people. What do we do? Where do we go today to meet someone? Well, we meet people where we are. And it's that simple. We meet people where we are. Usually we meet and get to know individuals where we have ongoing shared activities that are important to our lives. From those activities, from those places, we end up with a circle of friends and acquaintances. And from that circle of friends and acquaintances, we seek courtship and marriage. So we then have a circle of friends. And this circle of friends starts with ourselves, and then it includes our family, and then those that are close to us, and those that we, that we see some, sometimes, et cetera, et cetera, distancing from our closest friends. Well, of all of the individuals in our circles, who do we have control over? Well, we, we only have control over ourselves. 
So we need to begin any dating concept with the, with the questions like, well, who am I? What kind of a person am I? Am I honest? Am I moral? Can I demonstrate and do I demonstrate self-control in my life? Am I kind and considerate of others? Because you see, our own values largely determine who we will choose to be close to in our circles of life. You take a knot-headed kid and put them in another school because it was a bad school where they were. You know that knot-headed kid will find the other knot-headed kids in the new school too? Because the school wasn't the issue. Who we are largely determines who's in our circles. Well, when we make friends, who do we have in our circles? How do we treat them? How do they treat us? Who do we allow into our circle? Hopefully we allow appropriate others into our circle. Proverbs 18, 24, a man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A psychologist has said good friends, notice the emphasis, good friends are good for you. Good friends bring so many colors of happiness in your life by relieving stress, giving comfort, and removing loneliness. Healthy friendships are also linked to better cardiovascular health, lower blood pressure, less depression, and a longer life. So she says it never hurts to try to make new friends. Well, in the church, we don't need to be told how to make friends, do we? Actually, I found that there are many very lonely people in the world and in the church. You see, we can go to every big meeting there is in the country, and that's still no guarantee of having friends or making new friends. What often happens is we go to these events and we have this little circle that we join with, kind of like the circle in the picture, and we look inward, we don't look out at others. And when someone's outside, we may not even notice them, let alone let them in. And if we are the person outside, we may not have enough self-confidence to be able to walk up and say, please let me in. Cliques and groups thrive among us with those who are in and others who are definitely out of these groups. And even in our worship services at home, not, visitors should not be mobbed, but meters, neither should they be ignored. And sadly, sometimes it happens. After worship's private activities are amazingly important for us. And may the Lord bless all of those who through the years have been the place that people go to to hang out when there's a gospel meeting. And a lot of times you'll find in a basement a ping pong table or you'll find a volleyball net outside or a basketball goal, not because the family there is athletic, but because they're saying, come to our house, hang out here, let's form friendships together. And they are willing to host activities for individuals of all age. Now, many among us rarely have conversations beyond basic greetings in our congregations. A lot of times at most, on a Lord's Day morning service, we'll say, hi, how are you, fine, and that's about it. And we may say that none, or we may say that several times. We may initiate speaking to many, we may not initiate speaking to anybody. But that does not make friendships. At best, that just means we have acquaintances even in our own congregations. And we're going to be in heaven together. But a lot of times we don't even know the people who are in the pew in front of us or the pew behind us. So here's some suggestions for friendships. Put down our phones. Oh, if Cassie were here, she'd be wagging her finger at me. Okay. And so in a home setting, have you ever sat there and everybody's on their phones? I have when I've looked up from mine. Uh, so, the, so the idea here is put down our phones and actually see who's here. Now, if, if something's going on in a family where there's about to be an emergency and everybody knows it, yeah, you could leave yours on. But put down our phones and be willing to meet new people. So I used to tell my daughter 100 years ago, when you go to a meeting, which she did all up and down California, you have to come home and tell me about three new people that you met while you were there. Three new people. Tell me who they are. Tell me their names. Tell me where they're from. Tell me a little bit about them. That was her assignment. Well, by the time she and son-in-law Justin got married and we invited a few of their friends, we had 500 people at their wedding. And she knew them all. Justin didn't have a clue who most of them were, but Lori knew them all. Three at a time. Three at a time. Is that too much? 
That's doable for everyone. Does it take a lot of courage to walk up to somebody and say, Hi, I'm Greg. Well, that's not your name, but that's mine. Uh, so, yeah, it does. It takes a lot of courage. But we can do this, and we need one another. So be willing to spend time with each other. Be worth meeting. Have substance beyond appearance. Have something to say worth listening to, but not too much. Do be willing to be a great listener, asking questions without being nosy. Do be as non-judgmental as others if you would like them to be of you. Do be like Barnabas, willing to introduce those we meet to, to, and know to others. And you can look this up on YouTube. There's all kinds of videos about suggestions of how to carry on and start a con conversation because quite frankly, many of us don't have a clue how to even begin doing that. Now, at the same time, a caution. Be very careful to seek joining friend groups who insist on tearing us down to let us in. And the price of being in a group like that is to be willing to tear others down as well. That's not a healthy relationship. It's a tragedy when everything about us shouts, I matter, but yet we won't look, we won't raise our head to say hello to anybody, and they won't raise their head to smile and say hello to us. We have to do better than that, and we can. So how about this as a solution? Well, we'll make sure all of our friends are in the church, so we will never have problems. Well, just because the individuals we meet and get to know are members of the church and worship like we do is no guarantee they should automatically be granted entrance into our close circle of friends. Also, just because someone is not a member of the church or not a member of the church in our fellowship does not mean they should be automatic, automatically excluded from our circle of friends. Have you ever heard the story of the scorpion and the frog? So the frog agrees to carry the scorpion across the river because the scorpion promises not to sting him. But the scorpion gives in and does that halfway across the river, and they both drown. The drowning frog says, why did you do that? And the scorpion says, well, I'm a scorpion, and it's my nature to sting stuff. Well, in relationship world, some young men think they are getting kissed by a princess to become a prince, only to discover they are being stung by a scorpion. And that happens far too many times. You see, some learned and habitual natures among us are vile and poisonous. Our nature is a series of choices. We have the choice of how we treat others, and we also have the choice of how we let others treat us. Some people, even among us in the Lord's Church, leave a trail of dead friendships wherever they go, and no offer from a friend like that is one that we ever need to accept. Initial meeting. Dating relationships have to start somewhere. The initial meeting may take place over the internet, through friends, in a church or social group, at a party or bar, or any one of the myriad of many different places. Where do we meet individuals who become part of our circle of friends and from there become individuals we would date and marry? Well, this particular survey says that of the couples together a few years ago, 2017, 39% met online and 27% met in a bar or restaurant. I noted with interest that bars are listed first, maybe because it's alphabetical, but nevertheless, 39% uh, online, 27% in a bar or restaurant. Well, is, is that who we are in the church? Are we spending our relationship time online in various apps or sites, chatting with others via many of the, any of the many platforms that are available? Are we hanging out in places like bars? If so, then that is likely going to be the source of our relationship attractions because we meet people where we are. So let's look at dating apps for just a minute. So everybody needs to use them, right? Well, let's not be so hasty, okay? Here's a, an article that was written of 10 common lies people use in their online dating profiles, and there was a study done as a joint effort between two colleges that discovered that 80% of online daters lie about their height, their weight, and their age. Well, research and this article uh, author says that people mainly tell white lies to make themselves look better and get a date. The good news is that while research has found that slight lies or misrepresentations online dating sites are quite common, major lies are actually rare, which is reassuring. So here's the little white common lies. Age, height, weight, body type, income, job type or title, photos, uh, retouched, hobbies and interests, looking for a relationship, long term versus not, and relationship status, single or married I would presume. So it is normal behavior in many of these places to lie. I don't know that that's a good thing for us to consider doing. 
And I'll just simply give it this old comparison. Many of you have never seen a, a slop bucket, let alone had to carry one out without getting it all over you. But it was the leftovers from the kitchen in, in houses that didn't have indoor plumbing. You just put everything that was going on in the kitchen that was left over into the slop bucket, and then you took it out and threw it to the chickens or the hogs. Well, when somebody says, I want a biscuit, you don't send them to the slop bucket. bucket. You just don't. If you're looking for a good biscuit, you don't go to the slop bucket. If you're looking for someone to date and to love and to marry, why would we go to the slop buckets of the world? I do not understand that. Now, meeting online. Just as every person-to-person -person encounter is an opportunity to meet and get to know someone, every social media site or app we are part of is an also an opportunity to meet and get to know someone. The place of meeting is not automatically good or bad in and of itself although many are very questionable and should and must be avoided. I don't think Christians have any business hanging out in bars. Now, yeah, we can get a non-alcoholic drink there, but who do we expect to meet? What is there that would take us there that is a good purpose? It is not likely that we're going to meet anyone whose greatest priority in life in a bar is to put God first in everything they do. So we have to ask ourselves, when I choose to spend my time somewhere, is this a temptation to me? If so, why would we do that to ourselves? Now, once upon a time, the strategy by well-meaning people, even, even among us, was to condemn the place of meeting. So through the decades, skating rinks, bowling alleys, movie theaters, as places were solidly condemned, as was sources of information and entertainment such as television, and the internet in their beginnings. I know families who used to hide the television when certain preachers came to town. Put it in the closet, you couldn't talk about it. Why? Because those preachers had condemned the place, the source of that information. Usually it's not the place that is to be condemned, it is what happens in the place that is to be carefully considered. Now, Paul saying we know an idol is nothing did not mean that he was going to hang out in idol temples. I hesitate to ever say that we should ever have anything to do with dating apps at all, yet I doubt they're wise. I just don't see any wisdom there. I don't believe that they should ever be anyone's first choice in seeking friends. So I've asked around. It's anecdotal only. And depending on who you ask, some, others say many, some will say most, of our young men and women in the church are on dating apps and other sites or apps where communication, including flirting, is easy with someone you do not know. You see, anonymity is very, very tempting. So I would suggest this. Please do give the church a chance. Give the church a chance. Let's not turn our backs on one another in the church at any age. I would hope that our best friends in life can come from within God's people first that that is who we just have to have around us and surrounding us because we know them and they know us and we have so much in common with them. Well, okay, <sighs> attraction. In our marriage by choice system, we must first meet or have an encounter for attraction to begin. Many factors influence attraction, including cultural norms, personal compatibility, and physical features. In 1883, a marriage guide for young men said to seek out women with large bulbous heads. So you might want to carry a tape measure, gentlemen, and ask the question, can I, can I throw a tape measure over your hairdo? See how, see how far that gets you. Okay. Well, what attracts us? There's all kinds of things that attracts us, and it's very interesting. There are even Craigslist personals ads. You might not have known that. Someone stopped by a QT gas station in Tulsa, and then they entered this entry. You were cute, had short hair, small Jeep, dark gray, I believe. I was short, handsome, in a white car. We exchanged looks, and you seemed interested. I'd like to meet you. Give me a clue so I know it's you. Another person went to the post office in Wichita Falls, and then they posted this ad. Hey, you know, I saw your picture in the Most Wanted, and hey, when you, that whole felony thing gets resolved, come up north, and you know, let's hang. Okay, there you go. There's all kinds of stuff out there that we may not be familiar with, and that's okay. You see, each culture defines and redefines what attracts us to each other through the centuries. Nearly every physical characteristic we may want to change in ourselves, someone else in the world would love to have. Many parts of our bodies can be made to appear larger, with pads, padded garments, pills, surgery, and many of our 
parts of our bodies can appear to be, be smaller through being squeezed or surgically altered. By the way, the global compression wear and shape wear market was estimated at over $4 billion in 2020. Spanx rules, just so, just so you know. Okay, many of us spend a lot of time and money trying to make ourselves attractive in outward appearance. We spend a lot of money to fix our bodies, to repair what we think God got wrong with us. And if we were looking for a home to buy, we would have to admit this is just curb appeal. Well, can we have opinions of what's attractive? Well, yes. Abigail, who later married King David, is described as a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. She had a good heart and was beautiful. Absalom was a beautiful man. There was no one more wonderful looking than him. He was handsome, but not his heart. Well, God would have us balance that. Do not let your adornment be merely outward. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Because that is where God looks first. He looks at our hearts. And we may look at this and say, that's who I'm going to be. I will mainly look at a person's heart, and I will hope they do the same with me. That is easier said than done. Meeting and getting to know someone and being attracted to them involves appearance, but it also involves looking beyond appearance. It's being attracted to who they are through a sharing of experiences, preferences, and values. One summary of rules of date and mate selection is to marry outside your immediate family, find someone who's compatible, find someone who's a good fit, and there's all kinds of stuff about that, and then look for similarities that you may have with them that can promote closeness in a relationship. In Finding the Love of Your Life, Neil Clark Warren says, for couples, similarities are like money in the bank and differences are like debts they owe. So this is not saying we cannot have differences, but those will need to be acknowledged and given appropriate attention for a relationship to be successful. Okay, deal breakers at early stages of friendships or courtships. Well, if someone lives really far away, 51% said, I probably would not want to get heavily involved with a person that lives a long ways away. 49% say, ah, it's not a big deal. Okay, you, so, you go through all of those down to the bottom. Down at the bottom, it's, what if someone makes significantly more money than I do? Well, 3% say, that's a deal breaker. Ah, that wouldn't work for me. 97% said, I, I think we could work that out. <laughs> I, I think we could work that out. Everything else is somewhere in between. But what if, in relationship terms, there are no deal breakers? Or what if everything is a deal breaker? There's problems ahead either way. Some individuals are so desperate for a relationship, they're willing to throw all of their values out the window, at least temporarily, and accept any willing person who glances their direction, no matter the quality of their values. That's a game of let's pretend, and it's usually tragic in the future as hearts are broken. Or we become so restrictive in our willingness to even have casual friends, we eliminate everybody that we might have a chance to get to know. Well, you might not believe this, but there are families, at least in the past, who said, now look, we drive Fords. If you're not from a Ford family, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And you think, well, that's silly. Well, it may be, but that was their choice. And see, all of these things become our choice. And choices that we make in friends lead to consequences. We might say in the church, I will not get to know anyone who's not a member of the church of Christ. That's a choice. I will not be friends with anyone who does not worship exactly like we do. And that's a choice. We might say, I will not progress in a relationship with anyone who does not believe exactly as I do in every possible area of life. That's a choice. But there are consequences. We can become so restrictive in who we will allow to be our friend that we have none. And it's our own fault if that's the case. Before we limit our friends to an extremely small circle, let's look again at Acts 8 verse 4 where the church went everywhere preaching the word. It was the church that scattered and went to many different places in the Roman Empire. Who do we think they preached to? They didn't just preach to one another. They preached to people who'd never heard of Jesus. Can we meet and get to know people with honest and good hearts in our lives? In the process of making friends, can we take Christ with us in any friendships that we have? As we get to know individuals, can we keep Christ with us in that relationship? Can we invite them to worship? Can we find and explain Bible passages that share our love of the Lord and what He has done for us? Can we share scriptures about how to be saved? and how to worship. And if we're around someone from another religion or no religion at all, can we have a respectful and gentle conversation with them about Jesus? Can we invite them into a circle of a type of friendship? 
Can we have them come with us to worship? Can we allow individuals who are not exactly like us even to the outer edge of our circle of friends? But what if someone mistreats us? As one has said in a dating and courtship relationship, I would not have you spend five minutes with someone who belittles you, one who is constantly critical of you, one who is cruel at your expense and may even call it humor. Life is tough enough without the person who is supposed to love you leading the assault on your self-esteem, your sense of dignity, your confidence, and your joy in this person's care. You deserve to feel physically safe and emotionally secure. Within our circle of friends, we need to feel physically safe and emotionally secure. And if we do not, we need to kick that friendship to the curb and have nothing to do with it in or out of the church. So some cautions in a dating relationship. Individuals who use others, and that's what all of these have to do, that is no one that we want to spend our life with. This would be individuals that are critical to us about things we cannot change, that are physically violent, that fly into a rage, that stand us up for appointments, that make everything about themselves, that can't tolerate us sharing our opinion, that flirts with others, that blames everyone except him or herself, is extremely needy and demands that anyone but them take care of those needs, tries to take physical liberties with you regardless of your protests or concerns, and on and on and on. Anyone that is like that is not anyone who should be in our circle of close friends at all and needs to be kept at arm's length as we encourage them to correct. You see, rescue projects are not a good foundation for courtship or marriage. Now sometimes people are attracted to such, believing that their mission in life is to rescue them. My suggestion would be that our mission in life is to encourage such people to correct their values and be available to them as close friends only when they are ready to seriously work on their issues. Then they can be a friend on our terms rather than on theirs. Because individuals with inappropriate values and unresolved issues usually spend their time and energy in relationships tearing down those who care for them rather than solving their own problems so they can contribute to a mature relation as a friend. As Proverbs 25, 28 says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Okay. Becoming a couple. When you become a couple, you, it, it's kind of the, the glazes off of the eyes, and you start to see things that are really the other person. You start to see weaknesses and differences and flaws, and what was cute before may not be so cute now. What you first would tolerate without complaint, uh, you mount, now may say, that doesn't work for me. So here's an example of that. Uh, this individual, this man, is saying candlelight dinners aren't very romantic. Every time I lean over to kiss you, my nose hair catches on fire. Now, this is not a beginning relationship or he wouldn't have minded. That's how, that's how blind we are in the beginning of a relationship. What about the commitment or, engage, or engagement stage? Well, at this stage of a relationship, couples should have a good understanding of our partner's values, lifestyle, and goals for the future. And there should be relationship with each other's family and friends. Open and honest conversations should be happening as couples plan their present and their future together. Each of these progress over time with communication and with the building of trust. There's an old book that I've used a lot through the years called Too Close, Too Soon. Some in this audience had to read that as part of their assignments when we were doing premarital studies. And in their book by this particular title, Tally and Reed present the theory that the amount of time spent together as a couple is an important factor in how a relationship progresses from meeting to marriage. Now, an individual's personal choices in a relationship will always either be a temptation or an encouragement to the other person in the relationship. We decide, are we going to be an encouragement or are we going to be a temptation? Together then, as the relationship grows, they will make decisions about commitment and about their morality. And the book's message is summarized in a chart, which at first could be whew, pretty overwhelming. Okay, the gray part is what people do when they just follow their urges, concupiscence, lust, and desire. The white part of the chart, this area right there, is what happens if we do our best to have self-discipline and follow the will of the Lord. Okay, in looking at these things, we have a progression of friendship, dating relationship, and marriage. They're a combination of emotional and physical commitment, and they begin with acquaintance, with casual, close, intimate friendship, 
touching, kissing, caressing, attached to, long for, cry over, defensive of, committed to in a dating relationship, and then in a marriage, petting, passion, regular, and addicted to. And so as we look to these particular charts, we see that there can be a range of time that's associated with the hearts of the individuals that are involved. And so if someone is a lustful person, if they are lustful individuals, then from meeting to a sexual relationship is very likely to happen within even the first month. Now, a normal progression relationship, as God would prefer, I believe, in having a couple get to marry and control themselves until they are married, can take months and has many different stages. But a lustful individual and a lustful couple go straight to the top, if you will. And we think, oh, well, no, nobody does that. Well, let's look at another survey. Uh, four in ten adults say having sex on the first date is never acceptable, which means six in ten say it's okay. Now that's our world. So welcome to our world where, like Israel of old, everyone does what is right in their own eyes. So in this particular case, let's, let's look at these two things that we've looked at, initial meeting, attraction, curiosity, interest, infection, uh, becoming a couple, commitment or engagement. All of these happen below this line. All of these happen at friendship and dating relationship. All of these things are reserved for marriage. And that's where God intends them to be. Well, in modern courtship, where's casual sex? On the first date or before marriage? Where's living together without being married, as so many do? Uh, these things are not to be found in a relationship where the couple are doing their best to serve God appropriately with self-control of their gift of desire. Understand, this very chart flies in the face of the values of most individuals in our world around the world. So for us to stand strong as Christians and to observe the morality that God would have us observe is rare and we will get no support in that from the people around us from the world. In fact, we may get tremendous temptation, not from everybody, but usually. Okay, now a little more. Uh, this friendship circle, uh, acquaintance, casual, close, and intimate. Being intimate is not sexual. Friendships can be intimate without being sexual. And that's talking about an intimacy of communication, of words, of getting to know someone. And even when the dating relationship goes into this zone, touching is not, it's not touching as someone might think. I would say it's hand-holding and not much more. Not much more. Well, does that include the wrist? Well, it may go that far. Uh, but not much more. Because this is not a sexual relationship. It's not a sexual relationship at all. Kissing, oh, everybody knows about that. But it's not intended to be something that is done unless it is carefully controlled to stop at kissing. Now, caressing in the chart in a dating relationship is always outside of clothing, not of private parts. It is a gentle touch or gesture of fondness. Now it's not on the chart, but the fact remains that all clothes stay on till marriage. Okay. This is in keeping with Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 7, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. And that simply means, as I understand it, until it can be blessed by the Lord. When can these behaviors be blessed by the Lord? Once there is marriage. Once there is marriage. Certainly not on the first date. And certainly not during a long time. Only until the marriage is what is intended. Okay, so we're going to advise somebody that's in a relationship. When will they listen to us? Well, if they are just getting acquainted and it's a casual friendship, yeah, they'll listen. But if we wait until there's commitment and they're defensive of the relationship, they cry over one another, they long for one another, they're going to rebel, they're going to run away, they're going to avoid, they're going to disobey, they're going to argue. So if a congregation's leaders or parents wait until somebody says, hey, we're, we're pretty far into this relationship, you may not get anywhere telling somebody, oh, I think we need to talk. It's like, sorry, nope, not going to talk. So we need to start early with any advice that we're going to attempt to give. Notice, if you will, that for a woman, the progression is social, emotional, physical. For a man, 
the progression of social, physical, and emotional. What that means, gentlemen, is if we're not very careful, we will put pressure on the lady that we are courting to be sexual before it is appropriate. So we will put pressure in a way that is not right for the leader of a spiritual-led home. So we who are men need to be very careful to lead our home spiritually before we have a home. And no one gets to say, oh, I'm, I'm, just, a, I'm just a physical person. No, we can, we can control ourselves. Okay, oh, all right, 14 seconds, I can do this. Uh, what does a healthy dating relationship friendship look like? One where a Christian can spend time with others, retain his or her values, and grow and mature as a Christian as they are in the relationship. Can single women and single men of compatible, comparable a dating ages just be friends? Well, of course they can. Jesus and his followers were friends. They weren't immoral. Some of them were married and some of them were not. We have individuals where we work, where we go to school and in our congregations, and we can be just friends. And we know that. We can be in control of who we are in our relationships. And we don't have to say, oh, that person smiled at me at, at the station. Therefore, I have... No, we can be in control of ourselves and say, thank you for smiling. That's what friends do. Should single, your dating singles be, always be chaperoned? No, but they do need to be held accountable. It is okay to go to a single 30-year-old and say, hey, I see you're dating. Let's talk about what you do with your hands. It's okay. It's okay. Somebody needs to. And it's kind of difficult if, if you're the parent of a 30-year-old saying, let's talk about your dating. But why not? Why not? Can we, can we talk about these things? We talk about everything else. Um, what about online dating? To me, it's like looking for a bar where a Christian can hang out. I just don't see how it can be helpful in seeking a godly spouse. So let's be careful to avoid the appearance of evil. With regard to contemporary dating practices, what's off limits? Anywhere where Christian values must be suspended to participate. For example, it is off limits for me to go looking on a dating app, even if the Senior Sizzle app says it has 10,916 members near me. Now, I didn't, I didn't join the app. I didn't click on that. That was just a, that was just a teaser. Like, wow, that's a lot of folks. It is a suspension of values to be looking for someone on an app where the slogan is, life is short, have an affair. What does anybody think would come from nonsense such as this? And dating apps are rated whether or not the people you're likely to meet there are straight or otherwise, and whether or not everybody's expecting immediate intimacy. Now, it's not a suspension of values for anyone, man or woman, to initiate the invitation to spend time with others in appropriate activities. I can't see that God cares who says to a group, hey, let's, let's go to a gospel meeting, or let's go get a coffee, or you want to meet for a meal? I, I don't think anyone cares that our people do that, providing all can be what God wants them to be in those experiences. That's what friends do. And that's what friends need to do. When we talk about best dating practices, how do we distinguish between biblical principle and cultural preference? We need to start by knowing biblical principles. And that goes beyond just looking at the word in a, in a concordance. We need to understand what applies. So the purity of Philippians 4 verse 8 means that our hearts and our appearances are to reflect the purity. Purity of body and mind is not proven by showing as much skin as possible or by wearing clothes as tight as possible. And as we learn biblical principles, we compare those with who we are and what we do. When we make mistakes, we can repent of those and God will forgive us, but we may have the rest of our lives the guilt to deal with the mistakes that we make. So if we can save one another from those mistakes, we are indeed most fortunate. Can Christians date outside the church? Well, remember on the ladder of what dating, where it begins, at its most innocent, it is uh, something that Christians can spend time with others, but... Can we take Christ with us in that relationship? If we can't, why would, why would we get involved? If we can't be a Christian uh, in any of the relationships that we have with someone at school or at work, why, why would we ever get involved with that? Anything less than ideal has its consequences. Many individuals were and are converted to Christ in the process of dating someone. Many have been lost in that process. Just as dating and marrying someone raised in the church is no guarantee of a good marriage, dating and marrying someone not raised in the church is no guarantee of a bad marriage. But let's take the high road. Remember, let's start with the church first, please. Start there first. What about flirt to convert? If I understand that, that means I'm going to pretend, pretend to be immoral so I can convert you and convince you to be somebody that's moral. It's like, really? That's what we would do? 
Well, it seems inconsistent that we would resort to false, falsehoods to pursue a relationship with anyone. And in any dating situation, we must have the strength to walk away because we can control ourselves and our emotions and our passions because even in the days of spiritual gifts, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Okay. I'm not through, but I'll stop. And it, it still says 45 minutes. No. 